Hello. You join us here in the office of Dr James Barrett at the University of Cambridge. We're going to be discussing his recent paper published in Royal Society Open Science on how the Tudors got their food. So, James, tell us a little bit about your study. We had a, a unique opportunity with the, the wreck of the Mary Rose from 1545, which was recovered by the Mary Rose Trust where they found casks and baskets which were associated with over 4,000 cod bones. And these bones were uh, particular because uh, all the head bones were missing. Uh, they were all tails and, and bones from the, the fins just behind the head. Uh, and we know from historical records that dried fish, particularly dried cod, made up naval provisions for three of every seven days. So for instance, you would get a quarter of a dried cod in your day's provisions. And the question that we wanted to ask was to what degree the development of that navy influenced the, the globalization of fish trade and provisioning. And then the converse of that, to what degree the development of a very long range trade for dried cod from distant sources uh, might actually have sustained and made possible uh, the development of, of the navy. And uh, these are specimens which can be precisely dated, come from a very uh, particular context. We know that they're preserved provisions. Mm. And so that left a very simple question, where did they come from? Mm. And the problem isn't it's a simple question, but it doesn't have a simple answer because cod are a very widely distributed species. Mm. And uh, we needed to develop methods to, to discover where they'd been caught. So we needed to have ancient control samples. Um, Thankfully, most dried cod products uh, mm. in the Middle Ages and after uh, were decapitated. Uh, they cut the heads off. So uh, not all, but most. So that means that you could use archaeological skull bones uh, from sites ranging from Poland and Sweden in the east to Newfoundland in the west and from Arctic Norway in the north to southern England, for instance, in the south, that archaeological skull bones to discover the isotopic and genetic signature for different regions which were known historical fisheries. Mm, okay. Yeah. And then having done that, and in a way that's the big job, mm. uh, and having done that, one could then take a subsample of fish bones from the Mary Rose and to see which of those sources they had the highest probability of matching. And mm. having done so, the, the very pleasant surprise was that of a small, admittedly small sample of 11 uh, of the several thousand cod bones from the Mary Rose that, that we kindly had permission to analyze. So it's destructive analysis, of course. Mm -hmm. the, um, none of those had signatures which were uh, even remotely local to right. where the yeah. Mary Rose sank in southern England in the Solent. Mm. Um, there were known fisheries in southwestern England and the North Sea at the time and at the Channel and in Ireland. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, all of the specimens instead seem to have been caught uh, in waters such as off Iceland. And in the case of one specimen, the highest probability is that it was caught from the fisheries in Newfoundland. Mm. So how do we know that the sailors in Henry VIII's army were eating fish from this far away? And why were, why were the Tudors going to such great lengths to catch fish? <laughs> Well, the, the, the way that the method works in terms of how do we know, mm. um, the way that the, the method works, uh, as I've explained, depends in the case of the isotopes and the environment and diet. Mm. In the case of genetics, obviously, in the ancestry, if you like, of the mm. fish. In the case of the, the Newfoundland specimen, it's, um, uh, there's some ambiguity between the two uh, data sources, the genetic evidence um, suggests it's most probably from Newfoundland. And uh, the isotopic evidence is split between the probabilities are split between Newfoundland and Arctic Norway, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so on balance, the likelihood is that it's from Newfoundland. Uh, and this is entirely plausible because the, the uh, discovery of Newfoundland is attributed to John Cabot in 1497. And the English fishery there is known to have started on a small scale in 1502. Mm -hmm. And then it increased through the course of the, of the 1500s. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we might be picking up some of the very earliest uh, Newfoundland cod in England. Now your, your second question is uh, is why, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the the, um, uh, the the remarkable thing is that this is part of a of a very long term trend, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, in England and northwestern Europe in general, there's a, a gradual and sometimes punctuated expansion in the distant water fisheries and and the dried fish trade. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very economically important, um, and it's particularly important for provisioning uh, increasing populations. 
uh, of consumers in towns, for example, and uh, and that's a, um, a, a a question that I've been investigating for many years now. And what the May Rose provided was that opportunity to consider the ways in which uh, military and naval provisioning might also have been a factor in that expansion. Mm. And, and, uh, and clearly it would seem that that was the case. Mm. So, kind of finally, uh, what more can we discover, especially from a, an ecological kind of perspective, from the study of ancient or historical fish bones? What the the options are really only limited by our imagination. Mm. The, the, an extraordinary resource, archaeological fish bones, because they firstly are archives of the environment in which the fishes lived. And, you know, and that may relate to the, the temperature, may relate to diet, uh, may relate to any number of environmental conditions, uh, salinity, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and secondly, they are records, of course, of the life history of those individual fishes. And uh, when you combine those two, you know, basic repositories of data, then uh, and find clever ways to to read them, mm. then one can make any number of of um, uh, studies that can tell us both about economic history. Uh, you know, of the kind that we've been discussing now, mm. uh, and also about environmental history, mm. and uh, and uh, both our, our own group uh, and uh, and researchers in in you know a number of contexts, both archaeological and fisheries biology, uh, have uh, have begun to to take advantage of of the the remarkable opportunity that they provide. Mm. Well, thank you very much for uh, having us here um, this lovely day in Cambridge, and thank you very much for talking to us about your uh, incredibly interesting paper. My pleasure. Thank you.